call the meeting to order. <coughs> Item number one is roll call. All seven of us are present, Linda. Tonight, our invocation will be given by Dr. Greg Hook. He is the minister at the Garland Road Baptist Church. And... Hmm. Chris, would you give our flag salute, please? Dr. Hook? Invocation <coughs> first. Sure. Okay. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the freedoms that we have as Americans as we celebrate our nation's birthday. We thank you for the freedoms we have. We pray that you would give us wisdom that would use those freedoms for good and not for evil. Thank you that you can bring us together as a people for our governments, for our city. We pray that your hand would be upon our city and upon its leaders, especially as they meet this evening. Give them wisdom, guide their hearts. And Father, we just pray that you would be glorified by everything that's said and everything that's done. And we just praise you and thank you. Give us your blessings. I ask in Christ's name. Amen. Item number four, consider approval of minutes of the regular session of June 18, 2013, special, se special session of June 25, 2013. Motion to approve. Second. Motion by Ron, second by Ben. Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. Item five, awards, presentations, and organizational business, item 5.1, present the pet available for adoption at the city animal shelter. Looks like a well-fed little rascal. Gene Robertson with the City of Enid Animal Control. What I brought here tonight is roughly around a five-month-old Jack Russell male. He needs a good home. He comes available tomorrow. Our hours are from 10 to 6, Monday through Friday, closed this Thursday for the 4th, open on Saturday and Sunday from 12 to 3. We have lots of animals out there, need people out there to adopt. Gene, how old's that one again? About five months, but he's still got his baby teeth. He's nobody's calling about him. He's cute. It's not working, Gene. <laughs> 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 Kids were almost straight. Thank you. Item 5.2, proclamation, and Eric will read the proclamation. Miss Brittany Blair, would you come forward and bring your family with you? Mr. Merrick and Mr. have a special young lady here with us tonight. We have a, a proclamation to that end. And this is a really neat one. You know, we've had a, we had a very talented young man who... Uh, uh, represented us nationally in a in an athletic contest. Twelve-year-old boy shot uh, 30 straight uh, free throws in a contest. And Commissioner Wilson reminds me that there are other achievements of equal or even greater merit. One of those is academic. So, Brittany, it is a pleasure that I get to read this proclamation. The National History Bee was held on June 1, 2013. It is an academic competition for elementary and middle school scholars that test comprehension of a large variety of historical subjects. The students must compete in three stages of testing to qualify for the national championships, and they are optional intramural B, mandatory online regional qualify exam, and the regional finals followed by the national finals. Pleasant Vale Elementary School in Enid competed for the first time ever and sent not one, but four qualifying students to the regional finals in Wichita, Kansas. Brittany Blair is a 12-year-old seventh grader from Pleasantville Elementary School who qualified for the National History Bee that was held in Atlanta, Georgia, where she competed against 427 other participants. Brittany is an inspiration to her peers and has made Enid community proud. 
That's why I said that earlier. <laughs> The city of Enid wishes to recognize her for her, her intelligence and enthusiasm. Now, therefore, I, Bill Shuey, the mayor of the city of Enid, Oklahoma, do hereby proclaim July 2nd, 2013, as Brittany Blair Day. <laughs> Item six, hearings. <clears throat> Item 6.1, conduct a hearing to consider a residential plan unit development agreement, master development plan for the Stonebridge plan unit development located at the northwest corner of West Chestnut Avenue and, and North Cleveland Street and make a recommendation to the mayor and board of commissioners. Chris Bauer. Thank you, mayor, city commissioners, city manager Benson. Presentation is coming up. It is. We are in the northwest part of our community, right here at Cleveland and Chestnut. And I'm having technical difficulties. Hang with me just a second. Thank you. Always my error. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is the criteria that's in our PUD, and this was uh, what was tasked by the Planning Commission that heard this PUD on June 17th. There's four criteria. Is the PUD consistent with the comprehensive plan? Uh, does it harmonize with the existing expected surrounding areas? Is it a unified treatment of the development, and is it consistent with the stated purposes of the PUD article? That's the test uh, for determining. Planning Commission made a motion to deny. The vote was three for denial, three against, so it was a tie, so there is no Planning Commission recommendation this evening. Tonight, uh, part of the PUD ordinance outlines what we're going to do as Board of City Commissioners. We're going to hold another hearing on the same PUD. You're going to review the master development plan, and you have four options in front of you on how you want to handle this issue this evening. This is the outline of the PUD. Does not include the corner. This was handled before you several months ago, six, eight months ago now. Uh, the applicant came in, that was rezoned to commercial, and that piece is not a part of the PUD. Only what's outlined in yellow. The area outlined in yellow with full body yellow is all zoned R2, and the land use classification for this property is low intensity uh, residential, which means the maximum density cannot exceed six dwelling units per acre. Uh, here is the PUD that was submitted. This is what was looked at by the Planning Commission, and the yellow area is defined as track one, and that is uh, a density of about 4.12 dwelling units per acre. Track two, planning area one, uh, would include zero lot line garden homes, senior housing, but no apartments, uh, because R7 includes these other residential types. R7 also <coughs> includes apartments, but the developer said we won't do apartments in this blue area. Track two, planning area two is R7, and this is where the apartments are. The final piece of track two, planning area three, is the stormwater detention that they have integrated into their PUD, which will take care of the 61.83 acres that is before you tonight, and also the almost 17 acres of commercial. So they're providing enough on-site detention and the designated by the blue uh, to take care of the stormwater that their development <coughs> will create. Their development will not increase runoff at any other uh, higher rate than already is occurring pre-development. And that's what our ordinances require of them. That is what they're willing to do. Here, this slide simply shows you some densities 
of adjacent neighborhoods to the west is about 3.76. And remember, I said the PUD was 4.12, very similar. Uh, as you go north into Rolling Oaks, you see uh, one unit per uh, every half acre. These are very large lots, very low density. Hunters Hills picks up into the 5.41 and so on. Interesting, Hunters Hill Apartments is 16.31 dwelling units per acre. The PUD, the density is 13 dwelling units per acre, so it doesn't even rise to the level of that. My next slide will bring up uh, our city, Director of City Engineering, Chris Gadinsky. Thank you. He's going to tell us about the infrastructure. Uh, what I'm going to present to you this evening is the infrastructure development that's going to be required to make this happen um, in, the, in this area. First, we'll start off with the streets, the street improvements. We're currently already scheduled to do the intersection at Chestnut and Cleveland. Uh, we're in the design process. We'll move on and do our uh, utility relocations this year and construction in the next fiscal year. This is an overview of the approximate area that will be affected by the improvements. And as you can see, what, we're, what we'll do is we'll take and expand it to four lanes with a turning lane, roughly a five lane. Um, we also took a look at what it would take to accelerate some of the other street improvements in this area to address the, uh, the traffic uh, that's currently in the area and the projected traffic that will come along. We broke it down into three segments, uh, all of them on Cleveland, expanding them to four lanes. We'll address uh, the, the chestnut to the railroad or rolling oaks first. Uh, what we'll do is we'll start the design on that one this year and we'll put the construction costs and, and relocation costs on the next budget. I put together, developed a notional schedule uh, to show how this would work. This is the current effort at the intersection. This is chestnut to rolling oaks or basically BNSF, the railroad. And as you can see, we'll roll into our design almost as soon as we get done with the design of the intersection. We'll work to do, determine our, what right of ways we're going to have to, to get and go out and acquire those. We don't expect it to take us a long time. There's not that many to deal with on this one. And then once the intersection construction has gone far enough to net that we're comfortable and confident that we know what those interfaces between the four lane and that intersection, We'll start construction, and that should start in uh, 2015. And down here at the bottom is where we will continue to do design and right-of-way acquisition for the other two segments, Maple to Chestnut, and then BNSF to Willow. So in the long run, at the end of this, this effort, it'll be four lane, those to Maple, all the way up to Willow. Uh, there's sufficient water in this area. There's a 12-inch main running down Chestnut. There's a 15-inch main sanitary sewer running down Chestnut. That is also has sufficient capacity for being proposed. Uh, stormwater detention. Uh, currently, what you'll see, what you see is the stormwater runs out of uh, Rolling Oaks and down Rolling Oaks Drive, and then down Cleveland. Uh, this, this is two pictures. I've, I've the, uh, cut this in half so we, we get a better close up. Uh, there's also a overland uh, channel there where some of the stormwater comes from the west side. And the rest of it comes down Cleveland, comes over, and then emp empties into a open channel south of Chestnut. That's how it currently is. On-site detention will be taken care of by the developer, as Chris mentioned. It'll take care of the, uh, the effect of stormwater runoff from their development. It also takes into account what's coming in off the west side. It takes into account what's coming out of here and here, plus what's being developed. Our regional stormwater management will be accomplished <coughs> side of Cleveland. We'll put a regional detention facility over there. It'll account for the stormwater uh, coming down Rolling Oaks Drive and what's north of the railroad tracks. Scheduled for construction in this year. We've done a preliminary design to see what it would take to take care of the, 
the amount of uh, runoff that we've calculated out of coming from the north side of the railroad tracks, this layout will accommodate that. We'll have to increase it a little bit. Like I said, this is a preliminary design to see if it was feasible. We'll have to increase that a little bit to take care of what's coming down across Rolling Oaks Drive. Uh, and it'll be, there'll be a trickle channel, concrete trickle channel down, down through there. And putting it in this location keeps us from having to move this mound of dirt. And that's all I have, <coughs> unless there are questions. He had some backup slides, so give me a second. We'll just go through these and <coughs> the next one. Uh, which is a protest. Uh, the city did receive the protest in a timely manner as uh, outlined in the ordinance. And uh, I have the supporting slide behind this, but what this slide shows you is the protest area is 300 feet around the PUD. That's a little over two and a half million square feet. We went ahead to help the protest. We netted out the streets and that lowered it to 2.3 and some change. The amount of area protesting within 300 equaled 649 and some change. So the protest area is 28%. What's significant about that is if the protest is 50% or more, it requires greater than a simple majority of the commission to approve it if that's your desire. In this case, we're not even near that bar. So if you choose to approve it, it only requires a simple majority. Here's a drawing then of how I map that. Uh, the blue area here is the PUD. This line right here represents the 300 foot around it and everyone protesting within that area is designated in red. Uh, this further line is we had to notify everybody within a quarter of a mile of the apartment area, multi <coughs> And the yellow protest is more than 300 feet within a quarter of a mile. The gray area protest is greater than a quarter of a mile. We uh, received 121 signatures representing 84 properties in protest. 29 of those were within the protest area. Are there any questions? Chris, if, if I could stop you here for a minute, if the council will indulge me, I have a few comments I'd like to make and then I'll get to a question to ask you a question on this. This decision that we have to make tonight is pretty challenging for the commission for multiple factors that would have to be taken into consideration here. The first consideration to me is the rights of the developer. I mean, Mr. Anderson has purchased this property. He submitted a PUD, which even by your recommendation complies with the requirements for a PUD. To make this more complicated, apparently our city code states that if the PUD complies with the requirements that the city council shall approve it. It doesn't really say we can or we may, but it says we shall approve it. The second consideration is the obligation of the city to follow our master plan, and in particular with regards to the issues of water drainage and infrastructure needs. And we've got an obligation not to approve a development that's going to adversely impact our overall master plan. Third significant factor that comes into play is that our city needs additional housing, and we have the right with the citizens to have safe and affordable housing. We've heard over and over from individuals and businesses who try to recruit to Enid that housing, particularly rental property, is in limited supply and that this new development would be very good. And the final factor playing into our decision we have to make tonight is the rights and concerns of the surrounding homeowners. And as you said, there have been some protests and some legitimate concerns with this proposal. So as the council's representative to the Planning Commission, I was able to hear some of these objections at the public hearing for the Stonebridge PUD at the last meeting. You were there, you heard the discussions, and as you said, the vote was split three to three. At that hearing, there were several legitimate issues raised, and I want to bring those up and ask you to address them. Number one, the infrastructure as it currently stands cannot support the increased traffic that's going to be created by the addition of this commercial office space, <coughs> residential homes, and apartments if they're located west on Cleveland. The suggestion was made that the PUD be delayed until this infrastructure can be brought up to speed. We may be adding as many as 1,000 people to this neighborhood. The second concern expressed that was locating apartments immediately adjacent to this residential housing without some sort of a buffer zone or an open space or a park there would create a high crime area, would be a potential location for sex offenders, and create a situation where property values are going to decrease. The other concern expressed was that moving the detention pond to the east side of Cleveland would be very expensive to the taxpayers and potentially would not even work due to the elevation on that side. And furthermore, it's not really consistent with our overall master plan. 
The fourth concern expressed was that the housing density with the overall development being placed just on the west side was just too high. And again, it was not consistent with and not in harmony with the surrounding neighborhoods and that the setbacks around that property were not significant. There was also concern expressed that there would not be sufficient emergency access to this neighborhood. So my question to you after all of that is that the plan that you put up here basically is the same original PUD request that we saw back in October. The only real change has been that the commercial part has been removed and it's already been approved. The city now subsequently has purchased land on the east side of Cleveland and potentially it could be used for development rather than for water retention. So with all these factors in mind, my question is, I understand that in your discussions and Mr. Benson's discussions with the developer and the neighborhood representatives that some alternate plans or comprehensive plan, a compromise plan or a modified plan has been put forth that, that you're going to show us. So I want to ask you to try to address these concerns with what this modified plan is so it could be something that this commission can get our hands around and vote for. Thank you very much. The uh, next slide will be right what you need to see. Um, it's true that ever since the uh, Planning Commission meeting, negotiations have been going ongoing with city staff, with the neighborhoods, with their uh, attorneys, uh, and the developer. And this is a product of that outcome. Just to quickly orient you, this is Chestnut. This is Cleveland right here. This is the railroad tracks. Rolling Oaks Drive is right here. Rolling Oaks is in this area. Uh, one of the concerns was the traffic. Uh, concern and Chris hit on that, but we're going to four lane Cleveland. We're improving the intersection at Chestnut and Cleveland, and we're able to also solve the current intersection of Rolling Oak Drive to Cleveland. Those are all positives. I, at my suggestion to the city manager, since we own the property on the east side, just north of this existing development, all the we don't own all the way to the rail track. There's an owner. Uh, they're a small piece of land, but we own most of it, and I'm suggesting um, that we create a boulevard that had a landscape strip in the middle. We're on, it's in our plan, our long-range traffic plan to four-lane Cleveland, as Chris has pointed out. I have added a little more cost by suggesting that idea. Here's the reason the idea was borne out, because Mr. Anderson has been gracious in compromising uh, he is taking away the houses that he had planned here and the senior living and patio homes. And it's his desire through a land swap because we're now going to be able to do our regional detention on the west side that we make him whole and provide him the appropriate number of acres to achieve what he wanted in his PUD. And we think we can do that. The boulevard helps unify the development on the east and the west side as one development. You just happen to have uh, an arterial street going through there. The nice thing about the boulevard also is we have a controlled traffic. Let me show you that. This is a cameo shot of the improvement of uh, Cleveland and Chestnut. Uh, we want to move traffic as quickly as we can, and the boulevard helps because in that between Chestnut and the railroad track, there's only this one intersection that will allow cross traffic. That's one way to help facilitate that. And uh, we will be responsible of it doing these left turn lanes as a part of our four lane of uh, Cleveland. But the developer, and when on their property, they'll build these roads to city standards and um, then they'll be come back to the city and we'll take care of them from then on. The last cameo shot I have is this is right now Rolling Oaks comes right here really, really close to the railroad track. The neighborhood expressed to us if there's the railroad is going, there's people that want to turn left and go north and majority of them want to turn right and go down Cleveland and they can't. So in this proposal, I know it's hard to see, but we've created a left turn lane to create stacking so people that want to turn and go north cannot get out of the way of those who want to turn south and facilitate that traffic movement. Another advantage of this uh, project here is we create, you know, this is going to be the land. Uh, we really can't do much here because we're shaping the road. That may be an opportunity to provide some subdivision identity to Rolling Oaks and Quailwood. They have expressed over the period of time that they would like to participate. 
in the upkeep and the aesthetics of the entrance into theirs. I still think that is their position, and, and I think that's a real opportunity for you, the city, to embrace and work with them and create the, actually the entrance to their subdivision right here off of the boulevard. I think that is the justification for doing the boulevard. I wouldn't advocate doing it if we didn't own the property on the east side. Uh, I can't say that the, the, the green strip and the boulevard is free, it's not. People like engineers tell me we just have to move utilities further, Chris, so I've added costs uh, to the project. So that's something you can do if you think it has value or you, you don't have to. Uh, going back to this, um, one of the keys of getting to this thinking is we bought 55 acres on the east side in order to move our stormwater over here and early in the presentation tonight, technically, that can be done. But it wants to be on the west side. We can save a lot of money if we will take the water that's on the west side, deal with the here, channel it out, and keep it mo moving, versus diverting, overholding, and bringing it back. That will cost it, it's doable, it costs us more money, but if we can do it on the west side, as our comprehensive plan has always envisioned, that's better for us, so that's a win for the city. Um, we also started looking at what could we do with the whole 136 acres, and that's when Mr. Anderson said, you know, if I can't develop here like I want, but I have the opportunity to do that on the east side, that was appealing to him. So his concession providing the detention there and an increased buffer to the homes to the north and the west, uh, he's being made whole on the east side to be able to develop what he lost on the west side. To further the concern over sex offenders, uh, the city is going to designate this, and either this or all of it, that, that's kind of a detail that needs to be resolved as a city park. And by doing that, that addresses that people that have that issue, there's so many feet they have to be away from a school or park, and that satisfies that concern. Um, what did I leave out, Commissioner? Did I get? I think we'll, we'll, we'll no just keep going. Chris, tell us about the intersection at Cleveland Chestnut and the sharing of the cost. Oh, thank you. That's a good one. Um, this, we, we will share with uh, ODOT, just like we did on the intersection we just finished at Oakwood and, Cle and Willow. And it's about a $2 million project. So our portion as the city sharing with ODOT was about a million. And then you just simply just divide that by the four quarters. And Mr. Anderson's responsibility is a quarter of a million dollars for that improvement. He understands that. He's willing to do that. That's in his PUD. So thank you for lifting that up. Any other questions? For Emergency him? access, did you address? Yes. Um, <coughs> let's go and get back here. Right here. Uh, these are dead end streets. This is Statford, and this is uh, I never Oak Ridge, and this is Quailwood right here. Uh, this flows as it does. It dead ends right here on this property. This street dead ends here. We always encourage. I mean, this happens because roads are built and and it waits on the next development. Of course, it's waited a long time here. But we always encourage, from a safety standpoint, emergency that these roads connect and the developers. Um, land person Patrick Myers has done an excellent job of land planning his lots around these existing points. So traffic from these neighborhoods will be free to flow through here. Uh, traffic from here can flow this way. I think most people are conditioned from here to, to take the path that they currently do. New people in here will probably take this path, but it does provide alternate ways for our emergency services to get to these homes if, they're, if this is blocked and we have this situation in our city just <coughs> north of Atwood, Cedar Ridge. We have a substantial development there, and there's only one way in and out of that. And if there's a wreck there, and you happen to need uh, EMS life here, they can't get to you. So this is huge that it's interrelated. Did I answer that correctly? Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, let's go by these, because we've looked at them. Oh, I do have a movie. Can, can you click that, Dana? Yeah. I don't know that I can. Uh, Whitney Box put this together for us, and uh, it's pretty good. Just takes a minute. Gives you a perspective of the commercial. 
And those are just concept blocks that aren't exactly what Mr. Anderson's going to build. Here's the boulevard. And I really think this begins to set a new tone and, and actually, you know, the beginning of Rolling Oaks in that neighborhood. Um, I'd like to see this. Other communities do these. I think we have an opportunity to maybe do that right here in Enid. This shows that improved intersection. Uh, the water feature that you see there, and I, I need to speak to that when this is done. Uh, the blue water you see right now in this movie is intended to be there all the time. The large green area around it will fill with water in a rain event. And I didn't articulate that, so maybe I can on this. These are intended to be permanent water features. It's always been in the developer's mind, Mr. Anderson, to detain his water, but he also wanted to make it a feature that the homes and the businesses and the apartments could enjoy. Yeah, he's got pathways around there for jogging and leisure activities. So he's addressing a real concern, but he's enhancing it to where it's an asset. <clears throat> we plan to do that with our park to continue all of that theme, but this green area here and <clears throat> off the picture, that'll all become underwater and do its job when we have a rain event. That'll hold the water, <clears throat> and over a period of time, it'll go back to the blue that you see. So this is, the first few slides we've been looking at is staff's concept, a picture for you based on all of the collective negotiations and discussions and concerns up to date. We handed those to Mr. Myers and he's taken that concept. He says, this is the PUD that he can live with, him and Mr. Anderson. And you see here, we got 74 dwellings in yellow. So there's no houses up here. In the previous original PUD, they went all the way up to Rolling Oaks. Uh, there is no uh, senior living patio homes here to the north, they're gone. And the reason they're gone is this is our detention. Here's the area that'll go all blue and even down into here in, a, in the right rain event. This is constant. It's where the apartments were in uh, the original PUD. They're still in this modified drawing. Um, and the dwelling density there is 13 dwelling units per acre. And the open space that you see in all of this green is 27.7. Our desire as the city, uh, because we, we talked about having some of the detention on the west side and we talked about having some on the east side, uh, our desire is to have it all on the west side. And, and this plan will accommodate that. It is not engineered out specifically to know all the details, but working with our staff, we think we have enough land mass to accomplish achieving all of the stormwater that's on the west side of Cleveland and north of Rolling Oaks, keep it on the west side where it is, versus diverting it over to the east side and then bringing it back. So we, we looked at that option, have a little bit on each side. We, we said to the developer, we prefer it all on the west, and they have accommodated us. Uh, one of the opposition was in the earlier PUDs, there was road access out of the development onto Rolling Oaks. That was a compromise early on in the process that Mr. Anderson did, okay, we will redesign our uh, development to where we're not impacting that road. Um, any questions on this? So just to be clear, the PUD that we vote on tonight is only that square. It does not include the residential across on the east side. That zoning is already in place. There, there can't be apartments over there without us coming back and doing something else to that. That's so correct. This is all we're approving is what's right there on that screen. Yeah, and I, I think I can illustrate that for everybody in the room. If you approve something tonight, you can approve A, the original PUD, or you can approve a modification that meets your desire. But whatever you do, it's only right here. It's the PUD. Staff just is trying to show you on the land that you own, since if you agree to the modification and the the tension comes where it should, then this becomes very developable and desirable, and now yeah. we're looking at a development of 136 acres versus just 61 acres. I think with that, I've covered all my comments at staff. If we're ready to hear from the developer, are there any questions of me or Chris of what we've presented so far? Chris, you may uh, I address this in, uh, in the session and, and prior, but. Um, pedestrian traffic along Cleveland will be addressed by a, a sidewalk. Um, 
to similar to what we've done with our trail system running parallel, correct? Yes. Can you see this here, Commissioner? I know it's kind of ghosted, but that's a serpentine sidewalk. And we require that of developers. Our, our commitment to a walkable community, it's in our ordinance, uh, property developing next to arterials, we build the sidewalk, so yes. And in this case, we're suggesting it can be something more interesting than just a straight sidewalk. Anyone else? Yes. You see, we may have all the detention on the west side, nothing on the east side. That thing you showed us downstairs, that would, wouldn't have to do that then? That is correct. Okay, that's first I'd heard of that, I guess. And we save money. And I, and I think we saved enough money that we can afford to pay for the boulevard, if that is your desire, or you can spend the money that you save on a, another worthy project. Yeah, because we'd have to reroute. In closing, before you hear from the developers, I would just articulate that whether this property, either the east or the west side develops, it's in our long-term plans, it's, it's in our comprehensive plan. We need to do regional stormwater detention in this neighborhood. That needs to occur. Uh, I think that's being accelerated because Mr. Anderson wants to develop, and that's caused movement on that front, and that's good for this neighborhood. <coughs> We need to improve the intersection, whether this develops or not. We need to four-lane Cleveland, whether this develops or not. So many of these associated costs that you will be doing associated with this project are in your plan to do already. We're just accelerating those to accommodate the project. Does, does that make sense? We're, we're going to do these whether this is a pasture or whether it's houses and apartments. Does that mean other projects get de-accelerated? No, because it's in the long-term capital improvement budget, as I understand. And then each year, as you adopt your budget, you pick which ones you're going to do. But staff always offers this This is kind of a logical sequence. There is some flexibility, Mayor, to move those around and accelerate one phase of it over another. And I would suggest to you that 136 uh, development would probably merit that kind of participation. That would be good. Okay. If there are no other questions for me, uh, this is be the time in the presentation that we actually will hear from the developer. And uh, Patrick, please come up. Let me show you how to run this. Or do you, <laughs> that, that'll take you to the next slide. Uh, yeah. That's the point. Okay. But you do have to point to this or they won't see what you're doing. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think Chris outlined the project very well. Um, I'm going to be brief. I'm going to talk more about specifically, we, we brought some slides here of uh, that will show the housing types pretty well, the um, uh, examples of the body of water, the regional detention facility, and how it can be developed in more of a park-like setting. Um, <clears throat> you know, some of the, the best projects that I've been a part of and that I've seen um, in, other, in other places, you know, are inspired by something successful that you've seen other, other places. And, and Stonebridge, our Stonebridge project here today, uh, was inspired by a project that bears a simpler name called the Villages of Stonebridge in Edmond. Um, I was a part of designing that one as well and developing it. It bears a lot of similarities, um, not only in, in the, the, the area of Edmond that it was in, is, is a similar infill type project as, as our project here in Enid. Um, it uh, had multiple housing types as well as commercial development integrated into it. it and, uh, everything was centered around a large open space with, with walking trails and um, uh, an area that, that really gave it its identity. Um, it incorporated apartments and three other types of single family housing as well as uh, commercial office and uh, some retail applications as well. So um, if I get this going, oh, sorry. Here is, uh, this is an aerial photograph of the project I was speaking of. This here is, is Boulevard, and this is in South Edmond. Um, the outline of red is 120 acres that represents the Villages of Stonebridge project. You can see there's extensive retail and commercial development all on the north and west, apartments, existing apartments on the, the uh, southwest, um, existing residential on the south, and a new commercial office project to the east, as well as a city park uh, behind that. Um, all of this was somewhat master planned together, although there were two separate owners on uh, either side of Boulevard. Um, since starting our project, the city of Edmond also created a Boulevard street through there, and I can tell you it just, it really helps control the traffic. 
Um, it accelerates traffic, people getting where they need to go. Uh, and it was a gateway to the city, so it was uh, South or Oklahoma City starts uh, right here. Uh, excuse me, right here at, at Smiling Hills. So, um, but it, it just makes the, the area look really good. It's all integrated. It all works together. The architecture, the landscaping, the signage. Everything works well together. Uh, this is uh, a main entrance. There is a collector street that runs through the project, and uh, kind of ties all of the different areas together. This is the regional detention facility I was speaking of. Uh, you can see the walking trail around that. There was an apartment project developed on either side of that. Um, these areas here were our commercial office and retail. This is a single family project of what we would call garden homes, which we're we were proposing in our original PUD. Um, they are single family detached units, but they're designed specifically for those uh, without many members in the family. So maybe empty nesters, retired folks, something like that. Um, these are all typical uh, family homes. They range in size from about 1,800 to 2,600 square feet. Um, you know, they're priced from 200 to 400,000. This was a little higher end area, gated, larger homes, more in the 3,000 square foot range. And I have pictures to describe these. So we'll just kind of walk through the development. The point is that the housing types are very similar to what we want to do. The quality, um, everything was, was, is kind of inspired by this project. So when I show you these pictures, it's just examples of the type of quality that we want to do. This is just a, a main entrance sign. Um, this is pulling into the development. You can see if there's a bull divided boulevard entry, heavily landscaped. Um, this is pulling through the commercial area into the project. This is at the south end of that large uh, detention facility. You can see parts of the uh, stone bridge here, walking trails along it. Large body of water, develop, uh, apartments on either side, fountains, walking trails, land. <coughs> Close up of that. Um, that was a couple of years after the, they had been there, and, and uh, the trees have certainly matured. And it's a really nice place. The, that's accessible by everyone within the development, and people from outside of that area still come in and walk there and, and exercise and that sort of thing. So it becomes a real amenity for everybody in the neighborhood. Um, this is an example of just some of the single family houses in the area. These are comparable to what we plan in the single family area on the west side of our development. Um, very you know, high quality, a lot of three car garage. Uh, 2,000 plus square feet. Um, this is one of the entrance to one of the areas called the landings it's of Stonebridge. Uh, this is, it's kind of hard to tell from here, but this is sitting on the collector street. You've just passed the apartments and there's a, a treed green belt area dividing the apartments from the uh, single family. That's similar to our plan where we have the green belt in between as a buffer. Um, this was an entrance into the garden home area. It is gated here. That's another picture of a, another access point. But a little bit, not really smaller homes, just designed differently. These are still 2,000 square foot homes, but they, they may only have two bedrooms and just large living spaces, studies, um, a room for him, a room for her, <laughs> activities wise, meaning office and maybe craft room or something, but really catering to. Uh, mom and dad after the kids are gone. Um, just more examples of the landscaping. And this is a home in the slightly higher end area. Um, it now backs up to an apartment project that was built after the apartments in this project were so successful. The same developer bought property to the south and built another project. Um, this is sitting across the street looking at the main entrance in the Stonebridge. It's, it was a cloudy day, but you can just see the level of landscaping and the boulevarded entry and pulling through the commercial area to get to the residential. Um, that's an example of the neighborhood office. This is what we have planned uh, as far as size and style, quality of the commercial office buildings up front. Um, this was a slide that we had in the MAPC meeting that uh, was just an indication, uh, a concept of the proposed Stonebridge Apartments uh, gave you an idea of the building they're considering in the clubhouse. I, I know that uh, the department developers have additional photos to share. Is that correct? Um, so if you have any other questions of, of us as far as the PUD, I'd be glad to answer them. I think Chris laid that out pretty well. And 
we wanted to give you an idea visually of, of uh, the quality of the types of homes and that sort of thing. Again, fashioned after a project that's been very successful with a lot of similarities. So, um, do you have any questions for me? One question in the original documents that were submitted with the uh, PUD that came to the Planning Commission, there was a draft of the Declaration of Covenants, Conditions, and Restrictions for Stonebridge. If we do the modified plan, does that change this at all? Pretty no, much it, the same restrictions? Uh, the garden home area, anything specific to maybe the garden homes would be removed. Um, the single family stays the same, just fewer number of lots. Um, so the, but the, the quality criteria that are in there would stay the same. The same. Sure, yeah. Just cover a smaller area. Um, to that point, a little bit, um, our original PUD was centered around that detention and open space with walking trails accessible by both Still. departments and no, no, no. single family residents. And those walking trails uh, connected <coughs> to the sidewalks through in front of the homes as well into the commercial area to promote uh, pedestrian traffic to that commercial area um, and just in general throughout the community. All of that stays intact. Um, it's just slightly different maybe because the open space and, and, and detention area has grown in, into a city park, but the concept is still the same and it's, it becomes a, a larger amenity for the entire extended neighborhood now. Uh, this is not just an amenity for Stonebridge, it's for, for everybody in the area. So. Thank you. Uh, Brenda? Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager. Um, I'm Brenda Dill. My company is Vector Companies, and we have contracted to purchase um, 15 acres from Mr. Anderson. The thing that attracted us to this property was his planned unit development with the family homes around it being of the nature that they are. Um, we have been working here in the city of Enid, as you all probably know, for a couple of years, and um, we identified that you are in a real need for housing here. Enid is obviously in a, a major growth spurt, and um, your lack of good rental housing is pretty severe. My study indicates that 36% of your residents are renters and there is a zero occupancy available in the nicer apartment communities that you have, which are not that many. So with that said, um, our plan is to develop 200 units. This will be a A-class high amenity type property. We plan to have, um, this is a concept rendering of what we'll do, and I'll show you some photographs where we've taken some components of these different complexes and going to integrate them into our complex. Our smallest unit will rent for $800 a month, and they'll go up to $1,300 a month before add-ons. In order to qualify to live at our community, you will have to make three times the gross rent of your apartment. The people that we will market it, our apartments to are your military officers, your medical people, your new executives that are moving in with new companies, your oil executives, uh, your young professionals, this will, and, and your empty nesters. There's probably a lot of you that are getting tired of that yard work and this will offer a $250,000 living experience without having to buy a home. So let me show you, this, this is just, it's, we've taken some elements of what, let's see this is the pointer. What I wanted to show you here is the balconies. We will have these type of doorways and windows. We have a third of our units that will have sunrooms instead of balconies. They'll pay a little bit more for that, but they'll be heated and cooled and it's just an expansion of their living area. This is what an example of the clubhouse will look like. Uh, this will be a, a 10 foot ceiling here. Another um, part of the clubhouse it has a partition in it where our residents will be able to utilize the clubhouse. We'll have a um, business center within our clubhouse. 
This will also have a full fitness center included with state-of-the-art fitness center equipment. This um, will have a pool, um, maybe this design, but maybe a little different design. This is kind of a night shot of it. This is an example of what our kitchen pool looks like. We'll have granite countertops, stainless steel appliances, wood floorings. Um, I might note over here, you notice the built-ins here. We'll have nine and a half foot ceilings, cover ceilings. I'll show that in another shot here. That's just another example of what the apartment's uh, kitchens will look like. Another view of the kitchen. This is a typical living room area. This is the cove ceiling. We'll have this in all of our units. This will be very typical for us. You can see right here where the ceiling steps up, creates the illusion of a much larger area. And this uh, will be an example of some signage that we'll use as a main entry. This will be a gated community. Um, with security access to all points of it. Again, that's just showing you what we'll try to create as far as the monument signage coming into the center. And this is how we'll kind of incorporate the water features to become an amenity for the complex. Um, if the new modification on the PUD will uh, create a lot more So that's basically our plan for the apartments. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. At what point during construction would you build the clubhouse? The clubhouse will be built first. Um, we will probably build within the clubhouse a model unit so that we will have something to show. Um, my projections, I think, will be about 40% pre-leased when we get the clubhouse done. Um, I'm hoping that will be about 75% pre-leased when we're about half done. Um, my numbers, my market study, uh, things that will take us about I think this is a conservative number, but will absorb 20 units per month. So projections, uh, about a year to build, a little less than a year, um, and it'll take us about probably 10 months to stabilize at full occupancy, which is 93% in apartments. Tell me what absorb means. I'm sorry, absorb. Tell me what absorb means. Uh, that we can absorb 20 units per month with your population the way it stands right now. So if I build 20 units per month, if I complete, I'll absorb those in the natural. Questions? Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brenda. This should bring us to our public input sec <coughs> time. Chris, I have a question. Yes. One thing. Can you, is, we saw a picture downstairs, and we may have seen it a while ago, that was the original PUD and the modified PUD right side by side. It's coming up okay. after the public input. Thank you. All right. Yep. Thank you, ma'am. Mayor, <coughs> Mayor Commissioner, before we start <coughs> public input, we have a number of folks who wish to speak. I, I, I want to address a couple issues. <coughs> this item has generated, for a variety of reasons, some of them valid, uh, a white-hot discourse based on uh, substantial emotion. Uh, I, I wish to applaud the efforts of Mike Bighart, Carol Lehman, Greg Hodgen, and Gary Gregory for the way that they have represented the interests of those, those neighborhoods. I also want to applaud Mr. Anderson and Mr. Myers for their ability and willingness to compromise and provide uh, meeting of these issues and addressing the same. This project is far more attractive in every respect than it started out being. It's because of the input of both of those parties that w we now have before us, in my mind, uh, a considerably improved opportunity that brings 135 acres rather than 80, and it addresses a core overwhelming requirement for the community 
and it presents itself in a manner that is, in my mind, quite acceptable to all tenants of the plan unit development and our, our long range plan. Now, I, I, don't, I know and I cannot speak for everybody in the neighborhoods that surround this, this particular area, and I certainly wouldn't presume that I can change your mind. <clears throat> but there have been a lot of people working very hard on this, and many, many minds and dollars invested have been changed, and it's been in response to the input from the community. And those folks that identified uh, have, at least from me, my undying appreciation. And our first uh, speaker tonight is Carol Lehman. Um, if we are just, if we are considering um, approval of the modified PUD, then I won't. Um, I don't need to address you um, uh, or discuss the problems with the previous PUD, Dr. Uh, Van Hooser. I think most of the. Uh, it, it, most of the issues that I addressed at the MAPC have been covered. It doesn't give um, my clients um, everything they wanted, but certainly it is a vast improvement and um, um, it's um, worthy of a planned unit development at this point. Um, I'm sure that some people here are, are not satisfied, but um, as long as we're just talking about the modified PUD, then I think I'll just leave it with you all. Okay. <clears throat> John Hodgson. <coughs> Good evening, um, Mayor Shui, uh, Commissioner, City Staff. Um, I'm John Hodgson, and I live at 2224 Quailwood. It's on the north end of Quailwood down by Willow. And um, I'm, I'm just here as a resident. There are some attorneys getting paid here to be here tonight, and I'm not one of them. I'll say that right up front, <laughs> unfortunately. And I would say, um, you know, first I'd just say my, my support for the modified plan. I think that there's been a lot of improvements from the first plan. and. Um, the stormwater detention and the park on the north end with this approximately 15 acre buffer, that's a vast improvement. Uh, the four lane down at Cleveland, when my, my concern here tonight is the same as the MAPC and that's the, the traffic onto Quailwood, but this, the four landing of Cleveland and I, I'm, like Mr. Suber had said, the, the bike path along Cleveland, it will be a vast improvement. Um, from living in this area, if, if you're trying to ride your bicycle from uh, the area to downtown, you're taking your life in your own hands. Uh, whenever I see someone on Cleveland riding a bike, it's, uh, it's a concern because um, that's, that's a, a fairly narrow street with no, no side on it. And I'm also uh, happy about the, the, the planned reshape access onto Cleveland turning the left-hand turn onto Cleveland off Rolling Oaks Drive has always been a problem. Uh, folks trying to turn left it, it, in the morning or at five o'clock, you're gonna have a backup of 10 cars waiting for someone to turn left. And um, Dana, it's, are we, okay. I, I pr presented uh, some photographs and it, I don't know how to turn this to the next one. Th this is just a, a, a demonstration or a graphic of Quailwood. It's a it's a windy street. It's a narrow street, asphalt, uh, no no uh, center line marked on it, and it <coughs> intersects with Willow on the north, right by uh, the railroad tracks and the entrance in the Rockwood into uh, the other subdivision, Willow West, and then on the south it it feeds into Rolling Oaks Drive, which goes over to the railroad tracks on Cleveland for that intersection on the on the south end. Can you hit the next? And this this is our intersection with Cleveland. Um, like I said, it, the the plan, this modified plan, has improved access. So I'm not really concerned about that. I'm 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 very happy about that. And this is just another. Uh, view of the Cleveland intersection, and if you could 
Now, this is kind of what I'm here to talk about tonight because even with our modified plan, we still have traffic. I know it's not uh, directly on to, to, to the portion of Quailwood North of Rolling Oaks Drive, but my concern is increased traffic onto Quailwood and given the condition of Quailwood, I, I had my my uh, law clerk went out and took some photographs. Those aren't my shoes, but uh, um, that just gives you kind of a, an idea of, of the condition of the roadway. Uh, more potholes. Um, and if you, and these are just snapshots of the condition of the roadway as it is now. More potholes. Here's our, our entrance. Now this is the entrance onto Willow, it's, and, and that is a concern still because <coughs> with Rolling Oaks Drive in Cleveland, the, the revised plan does address that, but we also have the intersection, and you can see uh, the intersection with Willow um, right to the first picture. It shows the crossbars on the railroad track and then directly across the railroad track we have the entrance onto Rockwood. We've got a lot of traffic coming in and out of here. And just like the entrance onto Cleveland on the south, on the north, if you have drivers coming out, out to turn left onto Willow, it's, it's a problem. It's backed up. There's a lot of traffic on Willow. And so folks trying to get onto Willow, this is a problem turning left, turning right's not a big issue. There is a lot of traffic coming out of, of Rockwood also to contend with, but that, that, that is a concern getting onto Willow. And if you can, this is, uh, these are two photographs of the condition of the side of the street. I can tell you that the condition, I, I'm picking portions of the street out of my yard all the time um, this asphalt street. I know that we had a, a, a meeting with Commissioner Wilson, um, I think six months ago, approximately about the condition of the street. And, it was and about a year ago. It, it was in July I last lose, year. <laughs> I lose track. Um, about a year ago. And city staff had come out and, and um, the street department had patched all of our potholes at that time. But this is the condition of what we're looking at right now. And, and Dana, if you, this one is a picture of a, a pothole. Now this is on the narrowest or the, the curve, the sharpest curve on Quail It does have a sharp curve at, at, at one point in the street. But what the photograph shows is this pothole that grew so large that the adjoining landowner went out with cones and cement and patched the hole. And so we're having those type of issues and, and, and patches on top of patches on these potholes. And Dana, can you, here I had gone and just looked at the street specifications and um, as far as width of streets, and one of the concerns that I have about increased traffic is just the width of Quailwood. And if you can go to the next slide. And in looking at, and city staff can, can, can uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, the standards for local streets would be 27 feet and, and we'd have 33 feet for a collector street. And if you can go to the next, I, I had my, my helper had graciously gone out and measured um, the width of Quailwood, and we're looking at 18 feet at this narrow point of Quailwood. And the, 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 the top, uh, the, the photograph on the left is another photograph of the, the concrete patch the gentleman had made to the pothole. And at that sharp turn, we've got 18 foot wide street. And if you're looking at, at two vehicles of any size, one's on the, the side of the street already. And we don't have a, there's not a marked center line, 
there are no curbs on, on Quail Wood. But right now, the, the, the width of the street is uh, narrow when compared to, I, I had gone out and had some um, width of the intersection of Ramona and Johnson, 24 feet, and Indian Drive at Johnson, 29 and a half feet. And in comparison, we've got a narrow street. And one thing, I, I am in support of this modified plan, but one thing that we're still going to have to address one way or another is the traffic and increased traffic that's going to flow onto Quailwood and, and just the condition of the street as it is now. And I'd ask the, that the commissioners take that into consideration as part of the infrastructure that will be needed to support this development. Thank you. Chair Trojan. And if, if I could remind everybody for the, uh, there's a reason why we ask you to state your name and give your address, and it's for the hearing impaired who listen to our program. Thank you, sir. I'm Sharon Trojan. I live at 17 Rolling Oaks Drive, and um, I have three points. The first point is I want to make sure that everyone knows that this is dealing with Rolling Oaks Drive. It also deals with the people who live on South on Chestnut the village, the oaks, and people live on Quailwood. Just want to make sure that people know it's not just Rolling Oaks, because you hear that a lot. It deals with Rolling Oaks Drive. So there's a lot of people that are affected. And there's a lot of people, I want to echo what uh, Mr. Benson said, there's been a lot of people that have taken a lot of time. Well over a year ago, at one of our homeowners meetings, we heard that the Andersons had bought this piece of property, and we were really excited about that because they were contributing to our community and we greatly appreciate that. But I really appreciate the people that have gone together to make this a much, much better proposition than it was at first. And all of us have issues with density, safety, and the, the water. So this new plan very, very supportive of it, and we do appreciate you considering the new plan. Thank you. Glenn Julian. Glenn Julian, property owner, 1302 Quailwood. And I've just got to ask a couple questions before I get going. Mr. Myers, you work for what development company? Um, is that a... It, the, is it Dobson, correct? Dob I, I'm not certain what your question is. What, okay, what, he represents what company? Represents what company? He's working with the Andersons. He is the uh, designer for the art. Okay, the, what the company is that? I, you know, I don't know. Would you tell us who you work for? Please. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I work for Turner and Okay, I went down to, you just took everything away. Um, <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm, this is a compliment now. I went down, I rode my bike down there today and looked at the um, complex and talked to the people. Anybody in the Turner part were complimentary to it. I looked at the apartments, looked at, when you said, I thought you were with Dobson that are on the back side. And I mean, I was getting ready to hammer. So if it's a modified program, you know, that they've come up with today, I'm all for it. I will just back off. I thought you were with Dobson and. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you too, Glenn. <laughs> Greg Hodgen. I'm Greg Hodgen. I'm the president of Rolling Oaks Homer Association, and I live at one Rolling Oaks, which is the first lot to the north inside there. And I'll wrap this up in less than two minutes, and I will start by not talking about Enid or this proposal. The day after I graduated from college, I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I went to Colorado State University. I loved Fort Collins. It was a bit of a shock when I moved to Enid. Now I'm going to talk about Enid. This has been a really interesting process, and I think as messy as sometimes the democratic process is, with some capitalism thrown in. This has actually turned into something I'm excited about personally, and I think most of our residents are pleased with the results. I think I have to take my hat off to Mr. Anderson and to Patrick. They've taken some real arrows in this. 
They've listened to a lot of ideas. We could not support the original PUD. We did not like it and didn't think it fit with what we as residents that already are invested in this community uh, should have a right to expect their voices to be heard. But we also recognize development's gonna happen. It's important, it's necessary. I'm an employer in Enid. I know I've gotta have something to offer people that wanna move here. I think if this modified PUD is approved by this body, we can support this. There are some details that need to be worked out, but this is exciting for Enid. This is exciting for us as homeowners to be around it. It's exciting for the community to have something. I mean, look, the renderings with the boulevard, the, so many of the issues here that are addressed in this proposal, uh, I think you'll find that the residents along Rolling Oaks, north on Quailwood, south on Quailwood, really can support this. I think the idea of the housing on the east side gives you two ways to take people out to major streets and cuts the traffic problem in half. Development's gonna create traffic problems. This helps alleviate that. So I think it's a great effort by a large collection of people and appreciate your consideration of approving only the modified PUD. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Mr. Allen, I always get confused. Uh, uh, Diana or Diane, I always, I apologize. Diana. I, I stand corrected. <laughs> Friends call me Lady Di, with good reason. I am Diana Allen, and I live at 1614, excuse me, 1614 Quellwood Drive. And um, I just want to say I am very happy with this second PUD. Uh, I am extremely happy. My number one concern was the drainage problem. And you all have dressed that beautifully with the park situation. I think it's gonna be lovely and in addition to our area, I just want you to keep in mind that please address parking in the park. I wanna be able to get up and down Rolling Oaks Road and Quailwood Drive and not have to worry about people parking there in, and blocking our streets in order to enjoy the park and I think it's gonna be a great asset to Enid. I think the boulevard is gonna be beautiful. Um, the half acre home sites, I know six young professionals that are already considering uh, being first on the list to buy property there. They're so excited. It's gonna be such a, a nice area. Um, the apartments sound beautiful. They look beautiful. I wish we could look at them across the street and develop <laughs> patio homes on our side, on the west side, because we still need to address, and I agree, in a Waterford community, uh, because I know lots of people my age that are trying to downsize into lovely homes, and they're saying now you have to get on the list you know, when someone's going to die in Waterford Court to get a home site there because they are so lovely and in such demand. We have uh, a lot of homes here that are 500,000 and above and 200,000 and below, but we really need to address a lot of our young professionals that are th 250 to $350,000, and I think that these new half-acre home sites will address that, and it's gonna be just a lovely community. And I just thank everybody for being so patient and kind and addressing this situation, and uh, I'm really happy about it. So I just hope everybody will do what they said they were gonna do, hold everybody's feet to the fire and get this done. Uh, my second thing that I was very disturbed about is the infrastructure here in town. If you live on Cleveland and Chest Chestnut and Willow, uh, out toward the new school, it's very, very congested there at eight o'clock in the morning, three in the afternoon, and five at night. So I really would like to see the city address our infrastructure before we uh, get so enveloped in trying to put a thousand people in this new 155 acres, which I think is gonna be lovely, but we need a way to get in and a way to get out and to get emergency vehicles there if we have to. Thank you. 
Lynn Bartell. support the modified plan. Uh, could we address Chris, uh, the timing on Cleveland and also the park or water drainage when that might happen? It's more appropriate for the commission to ask Chris to. Chris, would you address those? Okay, now I'm gonna to have to recall what my slide said. <laughs> Basically what we're going to do is we're already in the process of developing the intersection of Hey Chris, would you just speak into the mic? That's already been, we're in the design process and that's already underway. underway. We're expecting to do design this year, uh, acquire the right-of-ways, relocate the utilities, and in the, in the next fiscal year, start construction of that intersection. At the same time, during this year, we'll begin the design process of Cleveland in three segments. The priority for us today is from Chestnut to the railroad, and we will deal with that first. We'll do that design. We'll identify what right-of-ways and what relocation design packages we need to put together. And then we'll roll in in the next FY and budget for relocation and beginning of construction. And that will take approximately a year to complete as well. That will be delayed somewhat until we know the intersection is developed enough and constructed enough that we know what those interfaces are. As that starts to roll, we will complete the right-of-way acquisition for the remainder two segments and plan the utility relocations for those two segments. And as we budget for funds and they come available, we will do relocation and construction. Right now, from a technical perspective, I prefer starting at Maple and going to Chestnut, but it's your choice. I can do either one. You're talking about five years? <coughs> Approximately. Five or six? Approximately. Give or take a year. That's, that's <laughs> end to end completion. Yes. Mm -hmm. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of construction. We know that the intersection has a 30 inch water main under it. Yeah. That, that, and money. That has to be relocated. That, that, <laughs> that water line was put in 60 years ago. So that's going to require. And it needs to be replaced, and this process will provide. Well, I should, yes, sir, it does. I would not want to build over it, and then in a year and a half come back and tear up my nice new intersection to fix it. My point is, it's not going to get done overnight. No, it will not get done overnight. We already have stormwater detention budgeted for and planned for in the current fiscal year. Uh, we had planned on approximately six hundred thousand. Uh, we have not done enough detailed design to know what the new regional detention will cost. It will be that much, I'm pretty sure, but we do not know. Their on-site detention will go in relatively, matter of fact, it'll go in before they start construction because that's the way the, the ordinance reads is you have to have that in place before you start scraping off dirt. It'll have to be stormwater management, and all those things. Now, I believe I answered the question. So I think the bottom line is this is a process and, and it, it will take time and, and patience. Yes, it is. And it's, it, it's a painful process because of what construction does to traffic. Uh, but it's part of the growing pains. It's a great problem to have. I agree. Better than going the other way. Thank that you, Chris. Excuse me? I said thank you. Uh, and and I, I'm going to apologize, but you live at 2034 Quailwood. Okay. It is Colleen, right? Colleen Okay. Okay. Uh, Mike Bigheart. Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Willow Lake Lane. I represent, along with Ms. Lay Layman, we represent the uh, Quailwood 
homeowners association, the Oaks Homeowners Association, and I don't have a thing I can add, I think, from what's been said already, other than to urge this uh, body to approve the modified plan, the modified plan that you've been presented with. It's not perfect, but it resolves so many of the issues that we addressed at the MAPC earlier and the concerns of our particular clients. And so again, I would just urge you to support the modified uh, land unit development. Thank you. Paper Banhay. Hello, I'm April Danahay, 1215 Dover Place. I am not a attorney, paid or not, so I'm just me. I'm representing myself in the drainage ditch behind my home. Um, currently, there is a drainage ditch beside my home between me and um, some neighbors, and I'd like to make sure that the second PUD, which is beautiful if it comes to fruition, uh, follows that drainage ditch along the line and that I don't have a home that's backed up on that and it comes back up this other way. So as it develops, is there a way that there are checks and balances to make sure that the properties in the Oaks and the villages are also drained into the larger sites? Yes, indeed. That, that process includes these very meetings, but any questions you have, April, I'd be happy to entertain them, and we can have a response from our engineering staff to any question you have. Our, you know, my main three issues really with the whole uh, development, I'm thrilled that Enid is going to have such a quality development, but was traffic and home density and drainage. And if those three things can be met, it appears that the fewer homes means fewer traffic, uh, better density for our home values. And uh, if that drainage issue can be fixed or at least addressed, then I think um, some of my issues are, are addressed and hopefully some of those who also live in the village in the Oaks. So thank you, please watch the water drainage. That's it. And at 2722 Stratford, I think it's Mr. Benedict. Ben Diddy. All right, well, see, there you go. You <laughs> fooled me again. My name is Frank Ben Diddy. I live at 2722 Stratford. And I totally agree with your modified plan. But this last week, the railroad people had Cleveland blocked. If anybody even tried to go up that street, the only way to get to Willow, I mean the shortest way, would be to go through that quail wood addition on a road that's about as wide as this podium right here. And that, yeah, I, yeah, I went through it, but I, I you know, I got to go to Jumbo too. But there was uh, there was probably ten times as much traffic on that street that day as there normally ever is. And I guarantee you, it needs widen, it needs curbs, it, you know, uh, I, I bet people are even afraid to get out in their front yard. I mean, you know, especially if, you know, if that railroad, and of course if there's a train going across there, you can't get out on Will anyway, unless you're going west. <clears throat> but uh, my, my third point that I'd like to make is the addition that you're talking about, which backs right up to my neighborhood in the village, I would like to see uh, uh, well, not condiments, but uh, a covenant to where the, the houses have to be so large. Now, see, in, in my neighborhood, we have a, a pretty strong covenant, you know, about fences, uh, even parking, stuff like that. But in this new neighborhood, I'd like to see something like that because it will keep the neighborhood cleaner and better. And otherwise, I approve. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the that includes the hearing segment Chris yes we'll bring back up our we're almost finished are you still in the hearing segment no that that's over I'm gonna as soon as we get our slides here you're gonna have to wait on me if you're going to set up Oh, you have some things to say? I have, I've got to read item 7, 7.1. I need to finish this item. i got to finish it. Okay, okay. Commissioner Wilson asked for it. I guess we're having some issues. Do I need to click the bottom again? Here, here we go. Thank you. Uh, here's the side-by-side -side slide that you asked for, Commissioner Wilson. And uh, as we've heard from the audience, this is the preferred plan. And the only reason I showed this is 
In the original PUD, track one was the residential. It was 31.53. In the new revised modified PUD, it's reduced to 17.53. Track two is gone. That's where the senior housing and patio homes are gonna be. Track two was the apartments. That's now track three in the new modified, same density. Uh, they have adequate land space to support the 74 dwelling units and the 210 apartments for a total density there of 284, substantially less than the 370. Uh, the criteria, I think we've gone over this quite a bit. We feel that it does meet the comprehensive plan. We think it harmonizes with the surrounding community. Uh, it is a, a unified mixture of housing. That's what we desire in our PUD. And lastly, it does meet all the elements of the PUD. Um, it is now I turn it over. That concludes our presentation. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Before we move on, I have a feeling the room's going to clear out shortly. Okay. <laughs> and that's okay. But I want to thank everybody that spoke this evening. And I want to thank the city, Eric, and your staff for what was done. I don't think I heard a negative total negative thought tonight, and that's good. That's good for Enid, Oklahoma. That is good for the mix in Enid, Oklahoma, and I appreciate it. Item seven, community development. Item 7.1, consider an ordinance for a planned unit development overlay on property described as the east half of the southeast, qu southeast quarter of section two, township 22 north, range seven west of the Indian Meridian. So now we're actually considering what we're calling the second PUDs, correct? Uh, my only PUD and with, modified, with the modified, modified mm -hmm. PUD yes. instead of the second, let's call it the modified. I think this is a great plan. Uh, I'm, I'm really glad that the neighborhood and the developer were able to work this out. My only concern with the modified PUD as it exists in front of us is that what exists in front of us is still a little bit vague in some areas. Um, obviously, this is in part considering the development across on the other side of Cleveland of some of the property we have. Uh, in addition, there's some agreement to do some form of some kind of park along the uh, water detention facility to the north of this development. Uh, I think those are all great ideas. and I. Ah, much better, um, and and I think we definitely should move forward with this. But I'm just a little uncomfortable voting tonight with uh, the modification based nothing on uh, based on nothing but the picture I'm looking at up here. Um, with that, so I would like to say first of all, um, when I came in tonight before I saw the modified plan, I was. Um, leaning very much towards voting against the original PUD because I know that that's what my ward uh, very strongly came out against and I wanted them to know that I did listen. I didn't communicate a lot with everybody because there were so many different legal things going on, but I wanted um, them to know that I was very aware and cognizant of their issues. And um, for those reasons, I was, I was not going to be in favor of the way it was originally presented. But having seen the modifications and um, seeing that everybody seems to be pretty happy about it and kind of all relatively at least in the same chapter now, um, I think I would move that we support, that I would move that we approve the ordinance with the modifications. I'll second that. A motion by Tammy, second by David. Yes. Any further discussion? Oh, what exactly are the modifications? I mean, how are we how are we defining this for the motion? What exactly? What exactly? It. I mean, are literally is it the PUD with modifications as shown on the picture on the screen, or is there a more in depth description of the modifications than what we're seeing? It's the verbiage where he took out uh, the, the tract two planned sure. one. And As that, it appears, that's, and that's and great, the details but, will be developed in the further But steps. there's no, at this point, based on this picture and pulling that stuff, there's no agreement as to the property on the other side of Cleveland uh, whatsoever. So if we reach no agreement to sell that property on the other side of Cleveland, does this die? It's 
more what I'm getting at. Well, I, I, have, I have more faith in the, in the city of Enid to get this far in one year. I, I don't have any problem in, in having the faith that this will move forward, Ben. I, I, to, to answer part of your question, Commissioner, that negotiation is ongoing. It's been very encouraging thus far. Uh, simple request by the developer be, to be made whole. There's, there's three methods to do that based on the cost of the property he's given up versus the cost of the property we're going to offer him. Uh, the size comparison and the suitability for the uh, defined plan as it fits on that, that parcel. It also gives us the ability to uh, enter an agreement either with this developer or another to finish the remaining acreage as we deem appropriate. Mm -hmm. we, we may sell that one at develop. But as of tonight, we are not committing to as you said, make the developer whole by any one of those specific means. No, we that that remains to be uh, accomplished, but okay. we're, we're very close to the uh, an end result. We have a motion and a second, but we have people signed up to speak on item yeah. seven point one. Carol Lehman. Say is, I'm assuming that the PUD is can contingent upon the stormwater detention structure being on the west side. Absolutely. So as long as is that's contingent then, and that's clear in the minutes that it's the- This picture on this I, side. It, okay, <laughs> yes. yeah, I'm looking the other yeah. way. The picture with the white that background, one, that is what we're if approving. If can't have the stormwater on this side, they need to come back and and, and they need to resubmit a different putt. For the lack of a better term, it's the smaller okay. item. Yeah. Counselor, you, you raised a good question about checks and balances. And, and let me state on the record that should there be any deviation from the, the modified PUD as described tonight in, in detail as captured in Chris's presentation, that city staff will be the first to question that. City council will have to make any changes of any kind would have to be done in this body. We're very aware of both sides' interests and the specificity of this proposal, and we will not accept any changes that are not captured tonight. Who's the next person? John Hodgson. I think he left. He left. Sharon Trojan. Glenn Julian. He left. Greg Hodgen. Lady Diana Allen. <laughs> Lynn Bartell. Colleen, I'm assuming you're going to pass again. Still <laughs> well, now would be the time to speak to them. Acreage with the wildlife and stuff like that because I love animals. I know that that's never going to happen. Would you care to step up to the podium and address that? Yeah. Did what? If you want to expect to charge somebody to capture it for the record. No, no. Okay. Mike Bighart. April Danhay. Frank Benedetti. I'm done. Thank you. You got it right, didn't he? <laughs> Any further discussion? I'd say one thing. I had two different approaches. Downstairs, I was really for it, and then once um, we talked about the apartments, I think everything looks great. But we're singling out the blue collar, dirty hands people that can't rent, rent these apartments, and I think that's what I thought we were short of. And if, if I may address that, you'll have people leave apartments that already to infill here, opening up uh, the other, other, other apartments. I just challenge some developer to come put in something for everyday person. Second that challenge. Me too. It's a good point. Further yeah. discussion? Would you, who made the motion? I did. Would you repeat that? I sentence? move that we approve the <laughs> PUD ordinance with the modifications shown with the water detention facilities on the west side and um, as newly presented. Second. 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 David. Yes, sir. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, please cast your vote. Motion carries 7 0. Item 8 under administration. Item 8.1 <clears throat> Consider an emergency resolution authorizing city attorney. <laughs> Exodus begins. Mm -hmm. And the mass exodus begins. A little applause would have been. Uh, yeah, I, I was <laughs> expecting it. Can we take an intermission? Yeah. <laughs> take a break. I drink. I think very pleasant okay? comments. So I don't know. 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 One huge file I can put to rest. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> We know these folks are here to talk about the fire department. <laughs> Also got a lot to do. Gosh. I'm going to start all over when we clear out. <laughs> I don't know where I stopped. It must have been something you said. <laughs> For one, once I was right. <laughs> Item 8.1, consider an emergency resolution authorizing the city attorney to levy a judgment of the Workers' Compensation Court in the, of the state of Oklahoma entered against the city of Enid in favor of Nathan W. Is it Chartier? Chartier. And against the city of Enid in the amount of $27,455 against the tax rolls, approving an agreement of, acknowledge, of acknowledging such judgment providing for the payment of such judgment in exchange for the city's promise to repay such judgment from collected tax levies, declaring an emergency. Andrea? Mayor, Commissioners, uh, this will be our first workers' comp uh, payment of the new fiscal year. Um, this judgment is actually from the previous fiscal year. Um, the court awarded Nathan Chartier $27,455. Um, following an injury that resulted into in surgery to his shoulder. Um, he uh, was able to return to work with no permanent restrictions, so he is back doing his previous job. Um, but we do need to pay him the $27,455. And because it's more than uh, $20,000, uh, by ordinance it would go as a levy on the tax rolls. So we have here tonight uh, an emergency resolution authorizing the payment and um, an acknowledgement of judgment authorizing EMA, which will also approve the acknowledgement in section 12, um, authorizing EMA to make that payment. Is that agreed upon or was that just awarded? Did we fight that? Was that? It was awarded. Mr. Chartier, who is one of our uh, uh, better water uh, department workers, uh, was cooperative throughout the whole process and, and it was awarded by the judge. It, that is frequently is the case. Just out of, out of curiosity more than anything, why are we doing this with an emergency? Uh, well, because it has to be paid within 30 days. days. Good enough. <laughs> I'll make a motion we approve this resolution. I'll second. second. Motion by Ron, a second by Ben. Any further discussion? One more Here. question. David. Um, the, when this comes off the tax rolls, is that sales tax rolls or ad valorem tax rolls? Ad valorem tax rolls. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, please cast your vote. Motion carries 7 0. Item 8. Uh, oh, emergency. Move for an emergency. Motion by Ben. Second. Second by Mike. Please cast your vote. Whoop, clear them off. There you go. Dan and David. Our things are screwed up. Well, she hadn't cleared it yet. Well, no, because a minute ago, his didn't come up. I didn't touch mine, and it came up positive. But, she, but that's, I, that was my vote, yes. Came <laughs> Big the gremlin between here and here. What, what would be your vote? Yes, I. Item carry 7 0. Yes, sir. <laughs> Item 8.2. Considered awarding a contract to SL Madison Construction, construction. LLC, Crescent, Oklahoma, for a storm sewer repair at 901 South Cleveland Street, Project F 1309A, 
and authorize the mayor to execute all contract documents after review by the city attorney. Chris. Thank you, sir. What we're talking about is a project to replace the stormwater sewer in this area and inspect and, pro and replace as necessary in this area. This is Bethel Baptist Church. As you'll recall, there's a sinkhole south of their driveway and their driveway has started to settle. And so this is to address that concern. This is the uh, bids that we got in. Mm. And as you can see, SL Madison provided the lowest bid. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can't see. No, we cannot. Uh, and it's our recommendation that we award to them. I'll make a motion we award this contract to SL Madison Construction Company. Second. Motion by Ron, second by Tammy. Further discussion? Hearing none, please cast your vote. Motion carries 7 0. Item 8.3. <clears throat> Consider a resolution setting forth the procedures for naming or renaming facilities owned by the City of Enid. Andrea. Mayor Commissioners, um, this resolution has be, been reviewed at two separate study sessions. And after input by the commissioners, um, and you have this in your packet, but some of the, the major features are um, there would be a $500 application fee. Um, and any application would have to be accompanied by a petition with the names of at least 25 registered voters for the city of Enid. Um, we did add in a um, minimum time. Uh, for example, if a, if a naming of a building has been approved, it would be in place absent you know, special circumstances for a minimum of 10 years so that someone would know that they're not, their building isn't gonna be renamed in six months. Um, the, Standard sizes for tree plaques are six by eight for bench, six inches by eight inches. For bench plaques would be two inches by 10 inches. Building plaques will be 20 inches by 24 inches. And memorial stones uh, would be 20 inches round. Um, for parks or facilities within a park, the park board would be the first um, group to hear an application and they would make a recommendation to the city commission. Um, for any other uh, facility, other than a facility that is being run, managed by another company. Uh, but for any other city facility, the city commission will be the first to uh, hear that petition or hear that uh, application. And, and the reasoning for the $500 application speaking. Would you like to know my reason? Yeah. I, to me, this is not anything we should do lightly. This should be an important uh, thing. And, and we actually have a, a naming and renaming policy already that's been adopted by the city commission. This would be a modification of the policy we have. And uh, this would just, uh, to me, it's, it's something that, uh, that we shouldn't do lightly. It, it should be an important thing and uh, it should be something that people would uh, really be proud of. And that input came from Commissioner Jansen. I'll make a motion that we adopt this resolution. Second. Motion by Ron, second by Ben. Further discussion? It's gonna Bring make it a lot harder for me to go name every bench in town the Ben Ezel bench. <laughs> but you know what, if you wanted to, more power to you. <laughs> Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> Item 8.4. Consider selecting an independent auditor to conduct the 2012-2013 audit and complete the independent auditor's report on the financial statements of the City of Enid, Oklahoma and its related authorities no later than December 31, 2013. Mr. Mayor, when Gerald, before you start, let me, uh, uh, something that we take for granted and a lot of people don't notice, but I do. Gerald just returned from his active duty training in the National Guard, as you know, Gerald is a Lieutenant Colonel. We're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, I was a little concerned earlier this <laughs> evening. Uh, Mr. Jansen brought to my attention that there was a job opening here in Enid <laughs> for a finance director of the city. Well, for a finance director in Enid. It's for Noda. It's for Noda, though. So I appreciate those. That's reassuring to me. We, we'd have never done it while you were gone. <laughs> Okay, that brings us to this item. Uh, we've discussed this uh, before some uh, in the last study session, a little bit in the study session uh, earlier today. Uh, the audit includes these four items. Um, 
as you know, as we talked about last time, we sent it out to 12 auditors on the approved list with the Board of Accountancy. Three of them responded. The current auditor is Ronald Cottrell. He responded. Colin Reed responded. And Burbridge, Trahan and Company from Kansas responded. Um, I just made this little graph. You saw it last time. It's the same thing. It shows the, the, uh, the amounts. It shows who they audit. They're all capable of doing this. They'll all do it well, in my opinion, uh, and, uh, and we'll accomplish it by December 31st. I did put this recommendation out there for those three reasons, uh, the experience, the fee. However, it is your decision, and uh, I just need you to make that decision because tomorrow I'll be calling whoever you decide on, and uh, we'll ask for an engagement letter that'll be on the next agenda for you to also approve, but it'll be in consent, so we won't have to talk about it much unless you want to. Gerald, Mr. Mayor. Uh, uh, may I ask a good question? How, uh, I see that uh, Ron Cottrell Cottrell uh, is also doing the ERDA uh, audit, uh, and I, I sit on that board, and I know that there was, um, you know, some of the reason that they chose him was because they also do the city and, you know, work with the, with the budget um, and, you know, making sure everything's in on time. Is there um, any, in your opinion, any uh, advantage or disadvantage to, to going with another? Well, I mean, you have to make that decision. I think uh, some of the, one of the commissioner, Commissioner Matt Hoosers, brought up a, a potential uh, a reason. Um, I think there's reasons uh, uh, to select Ron Cottrell. Um, you, you guys, the, the auditor works for you guys, so you need to select who you who you want. And all, any of those three will accomplish the job. Um, the fact that he is auditing ERDA makes that a little bit simpler. Um, however, we'll take. If you don't choose him, we'll take uh, whoever the city's auditor is, take his results, and plug it in, and it'll be fine. Mr. Mayor, I'd make the motion that we select Colin Reed for the auditors for next year. Second. Motion with David. Do you want to explain, though, why so people understand? Uh, wait wait a minute. we got a motion and a second. Now we can discuss it. Yes, thank, thanks, thanks, Terry. I've, to discuss it. The um, my thought process is two things. One, this is not a this is a professional fee and not a competitive bid situation. So we are not obligated to take the lowest bidder. Yes. My thought process was that the auditors are the watchdog basically of the dollars and of everything we do, and that periodically that should just be changed. I think you get in the routine of kind of seeing the same processes and so forth, and it's just a good idea to uh, to change. So for really for no other reason than that. Not, certainly not a complaint against our pri previous auditor. I just think it's time to make a change after five years, and so that's the basis of my uh, motion. Are we voting for just this one year or for five more years? Well, typically what we like to do, we don't like to change auditors every year. I can certainly tell you that. We, we like to go out, uh, this would be for one year with the option to renew for four, and that's what the city has done for about the last decade or more. But uh, again, if you, if you were unhappy or something, we could always change. Certainly you guys make that decision every year. But, but I'd like to see it as we're changing to Cole and Reed, and unless they do something that would cause us to change our minds, we would probably stay with them for the next five years, and then we would bid this out again, just like we're doing now. The motion by, who made the motion? David, and the second by Ron. Further discussion? Please cast your vote. Motion carries 6 1. Item 9, consent items. Make a motion to uh, approve a consent item. Second. Motion by Mike, second by Ron. F further discussion? Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7 0. Item 10, we will now recess to, co to convene as the Indian Municipal Authority. All seven of the trustees of the Indian Municipal Authority regular meeting are present. Item 12, to convene as the Indian Municipal Authority regular meeting. Item 12.1, approve an agreement acknowledging and providing for the judgment of the Workers' Compensation Court of the State of Oklahoma 
entered in favor of Nathan W. Chartier and against the City of Enid in the amount of $27,455. Motion to approve. Second by Ron. Second by Mike. Any further discussion? Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. No need for an emergency on this one, Andrea. Item 12.2, <clears throat> approve and execute payment of SEMA annual Cimarron Terrace contract, con, contractual water royalties through June 30, 2013 in the amount of $140,000. Gerald? Yes, uh, Chairman Chewy and trustees, I, I just, uh, this item is on there because it exceeds $50,000. Uh, we semi-annually pay the, the Central National Bank, who is the trustee for the Cimarron Terrace for uh, the water that is used, um, and that's what this item authorizes. Where, uh, Gerald, where is the Cimarron Terrace? Uh, well, it's, it covers a lot of areas, the, from the Ames to the Ringwood Wealth. Uh, out west, okay. <coughs> Move we approve? Second. Uh, motion by Ben, a second by Tammy. No, I made the motion and Ron seconded it. <laughs> But whatever, I don't care. Straighten me out, doesn't maybe, bother maybe me. Maybe I did it at the same time. You want to make the motion, Tammy? That's fine. I move to approve. Motion by Tammy, a second by? Second. Dan, please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> Item 12.3, approval of claims in the amount of $76,281.24. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Ben, a second by Mike. Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. <clears throat> we'll now adjourn to convene as the Economic Development Authority. All trustees of the Enid Economic De Development Authority are present. The Enid Economic Development Authority regular meeting is, is now in order. Item 15.1. <clears throat> Approval of claims in the amount of $220,298.87. Motion to approve. Motion by Ron. Second. Second by Mike. Please cast your vote. Motion carries 7-0. We'll now adjourn to reconvene as the Enid City Commission. Under item 17, public discussion, there is none. Do you have a motion to adjourn? I make that motion. Second. second by Mike, a second by Ben. Please cast your vote. <laughs> <laughs> wow, David. You don't want to leave yet? <laughs> I don't uh, know to something, right? Motion, car <laughs> motion carries 5-0. Just doesn't feel right. <laughs> oh, so yeah. all that was